Greetings, I'm John Duvall. Welcome back to another Truth Factor discussion. Yes, we are back. We started last week resuming from a break that we had for about, well, since 2020. And we are continuing this morning by looking at five tips for beneficial Bible study. And so we want to thank you so much for joining us for, to our, for our study today. And here in just a moment, I'll tell you how you can participate. But let me go ahead and bring everyone in in a nice, neat gallery view. There's the folks. And we have Paul Adams from Ellettsville, Indiana. And then we have Brian Haynes from up in Oregon, specifically uh, Portland, if I remember correctly, area. And then we have Brendan Ashby from, um, where are you at, Tucson, Arizona? Yeah, the, the good old Tucson. Okay. There and then Tom Thornhill from Bellflower, California. I didn't take the time to do the intros last week, so it's good to have everyone with us here today. Now, let me share with you how you can participate in today's study. If you'll notice the ticker at the bottom of the screen, we'll share with you some of these different ways. First off, we are live streaming this to our YouTube channel, which is Truth Factor Live. If you're watching us there, feel free to drop your question or comments in the comment area or the chat area. If you're watching us via our Facebook page, which is also Truth Factor Live, then be sure to leave a comment on this live video. Both of those will come to us. If you would prefer, you could send us a comment via Twitter. Uh, use at Truth Factor Live, and that'll eventually get circulated into our mix as well. We do have an email address, questions at truthfactorlive.com. I don't always monitor that as much as I should during the study, but that is possible if you want to get in touch with us later. And also, if you'll notice on the screen there, we have individual email, email addresses of the various hosts, and you can contact us that way or them that way. And last but not least, you can also send us a text message or a voicemail if you would like at 405-726-1179. And all that information, of course, is on the screen. All righty. Well, let's go ahead and let's introduce our study for today. As we said, well, oh, one more thing. Sorry, Brian mentioned this to me earlier. I didn't say this. And do I have it on the screen? No, it's not. How sad. Go to truthfactor.com. Truthfactor.com is where we have, um, you can watch the stream live from there if you'd like to do that. We also have last week's video up on the front page. If you wanna watch it there, of course it's always available on YouTube and Facebook as well. But also there's a podcast of these studies. Uh, Brian's son, um, what's his name, Brian? Uh, Grant, Grant. Grant. Brian's son, Grant, takes the, um, the videos and puts the audio version of them into the RSS feed. And so you'll see a link to that on Truth Factor page. You'll actually see each one listed there. So feel free to subscribe to the podcast if you'd like to do that. Maybe catch it at a later point in time. You know, I know sometimes our faces get, people get tired of looking at such, you know, it's hard to keep humility when you look the way that we do. And people just get tired of looking at it. They they feel jealous of us. <laughs> I'm only kidding. But you know, if you want to exercise and listen to us, if that helps you run from something, then you could do that as well. Okay, enough of that. Let's go ahead and I said at the start of this five tips for beneficial Bible study that we would throw this to Brendan first. So Brendan, if you would go ahead and take it away. Thanks, John. <clears throat> there we go. Now my voice is working. Um, for those watching at the home congregation, uh, this is going to sound very familiar, familiar because every time I have the opportunity to talk about this, I will hit this first point. And tip number one for our audience today is build the habit of daily Bible reading. What does this have to do with Bible study? Well, we look in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13. And Paul gives instructions to Timothy there that part of his job as a preacher there is to, and on my Bible just close the page, in verse four, 13 there, chapter 4, and he says, Until I come, give attention to the public reading of Scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Now, in the first century, they were not blessed like we are to where we can have nice, fancy, bound Bibles or we can take it with us or have it on our app, on our phones. They were going to get access to the Scripture. It was through the coming together to listen to it being read. 
Now, we're immensely blessed that we can read the scriptures for ourselves. So why build the habit of daily Bible reading? Um, in Ephesians chapter 3, verse, verses 18 through 19, uh, Paul prays for the Ephesians that they would be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ which surpasses knowledge that they may be filled up to the fullness of God. Those four words there, breadth, length, height, and depth. We're going to focus on the first and the last one. So we need to, before we can plunge the depths of God, which I would call that deep Bible study, we need to have access to the breadth of God. And that's what daily Bible reading does. Having this habit of just reading the scriptures daily gets us familiar with the whole Bible. And what we'll see is when you do this, as we just said, you'll have a better grasp of the whole Bible. You'll be familiar with, you'll start being able to connect the dots between Old Testament and New Testament. And, you know, when, when you read an epistle, you're like, oh, that sounds familiar. I think Paul might be referencing back to Genesis or Kings or something. Uh, especially when you read Hebrews. So there's all sorts of interconnections there. And you will start feeling like you have a better understanding and feel of the whole Bible. And because God made our brains the way they are, they'll start making those connections and it'll start uh, just, you'll start getting more and more familiar. And here's the other half, benefit of daily Bible reading. And we'll touch on this more in just a minute. But as you're reading, Make sure you have some sort of note-taking device near you. And if you don't understand anything, if you have questions about something, make a note of that. Because then when it comes time for Bible study, say on Saturday morning or something, uh, you have something to study. You have something you can go back over the what you read the week before, and then you can really plunge the depths of it. And so a couple recommendations. Um, Mark Roberts' five-day day five-day daily Bible reading plan has been very effective. I've used it myself the past three years, and that's a chronological uh, daily Bible reading plan. So you will read through the Bible in roughly the order that it takes place in. There's an Old Testament reading and New Testament reading each day with Psalms interspersed. We'll drop a link in the chat for you to access that. Um, but even then, a whole Bible plan might be a lot to take in at first so maybe find a new testament plan over the whole year or i preach we're doing that as a congregation we're reading through the whole new testament this year and maybe that seems too big well open up the book of proverbs and just get in the habit of reading a chapter of proverbs a day and you'll start building that habit of some sort of engagement with the word on a daily basis and i think you'll see that'll pay dividends in the long run for your bible study Back to you, John. All righty. Let's see, Brendan. Still getting my, my keyboard figured out here. <laughs> All right. So um, what about topical studies? Would, would you would you say that, that there's a room for doing a topical study? Or would you think it would be better to lean more towards textual studies? Or maybe a little bit of both? I think there's room for both. Um reading through the whole Bible, um, the, the great thing is, yeah, you'll have thought, uh, you'll have ideas for maybe a textual study, but even within that textual study, um, a certain phraseology might stick out to you, and you want to do a topical study on that. For example, I was reading through Nehemiah, or I was reading a, a section of Nehemiah uh, in December, where Nehemiah uh, admonishes the people that says, do not weep, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. I'm like, huh. That's an interesting phrase. I want to know how is the joy of God my strength? And so that that was a springboard for a topical study into what the Bible says about joy and how it's strengthening. And so it it just, this is how you get uh, the ideas for what you want to study. And it could go either way. So, yeah. See, and, uh, and uh, you know, to kind of mm -hmm. build a little bit on what uh, Brendan is saying there, uh, I, I think our primary emphasis needs to be needs to be the scriptural from the
guys, I muted you. Hang on just a moment. You'll leave parts out. You're, you're not going to get a complete translation of the scripture, or you're not going to get a complete overview of the scripture if all you do all the time is uh, is is topics. But you definitely need both because there's a time when you need to stop and do the topics. Okay, I'm sorry, I I, I I muted you because I've got a shortcut that both muted and brought up your lower third. So I'm going to have to go back. <laughs> and Who was muted? One. Me or Tom? Tom. Okay. Um, oh, oh, only well, during the so, important part, so you got the well, gist well, of it when he was done. Yeah, I, and I was going to say, well, uh, well, uh, so you're just saying what my comments are worth. I understand. So, no, no. But see, yeah, but, one you know, thing real quick. I, I wanna, okay. Yeah, can I really, real quick, add something? You know, I, I, we've been using that Mark Roberts uh, five day Bible reading pen. We pass it out to the congregation every year. We've done that probably for five to ten years, however long. Uh, Mark or. Uh, uh, Brendan made the point about if you can't read the whole Bible, and the one thing that I see in that Bible reading plan, sometimes the readings are long, and sometimes they're not as long. So you, you can balance it a little bit. But if you don't have time for all of it, that Bible reading plan gives you read through the New Testament one chapter a day, five days a week. It, it's remarkable. So if all you can read is the New Testament, take Mark's plan, and you can read through it. I, he, he dispenses the Gospels in between the various letters and so on. So it's a good way to do it. And, yeah. and to Tom's point, most chapters in your New Testaments can be read in five minutes or less. And so wake up five minutes early than you normally do and just mark one and you just keep doing that. And yeah, you may not read the whole Bible this year, but guess what? If you've never done this, you'll read more Bible this year than you did last year. And that's not a bad yeah. thing. Um, and then as a segue into Tom's point, um, something I've done and I know other brethren have done is in order to make sure that the scriptures continue to be fresh in your mind and you're not getting too accustomed to the wordage of a particular translation, the daily Bible reading gives you a chance to read through different translations each year. So because of that, I've read through New King James, New American Standard, the, the New English Translation, and this year will be the Legacy Standard Version. And... You know, the, those are all, all more one-to-one -one <laughs> translations, but there's some value there of just you can get a feel for how different translations word things. And sometimes you're like, oh, now that that's kind of more clear than what my translation does. Or you may come across a passage, you just go, what were they thinking there? But it gets you thinking about the text. And so you don't have to do it that way, but... It's been a fun experience for me. So, okay, all right, very good, very good. One one note we'll throw it to Tom. I think for the second tip is even preachers struggle with the the topic versus the um, the the um, verse textual studies because many times as preachers, there's a whole lot of topics we want to cover, but I think sometimes we I, 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 we generally speaking, the tendency is to lay more topically from the sermon than actually textually. And you gotta have a good balance or else you, you could hold to a topic and a point in position that the text doesn't support, but because you never really look at the text in depth, you may find you may never find that you're missing that. So, yeah. All right, so we have time up on the screen. Let's go to yeah. tip number two for a beneficial Bible study. Tom? Yeah, all right. Uh, you know, tying into your point there, John, I know that I have now for about 10 years, at least one Sunday a month, we just go through a book of the Bible. And however long it takes me, I do that. And so there's lots of talk te uh, textual studies. But anyways, and that kind of leads to the point, and, and, and Brendan, I don't know if I want to say he stole my thunder, but as he, as he made the point, he's leading into the, the second point is use multiple translations. And when I talk about multiple translations, let, let me start by saying this. Uh, you should have a primary translation, uh, first and foremost, and that's going to be the translation that you're going to take with you to services. It's going to be the one that if you're studying with others, it's the primary one that you're going to use. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, there is no translation of the English Bible that is perfect. And the other thing is, as you're reading through text, you from time to time, you're going to come across wordings or phrases that are, uh, what's that mean? 
Uh, and uh, and you can go to your commentaries, and that's that's a place to go. But I re- honestly think the best quote unquote commentary that you have is to look at other translations of the scripture. And I like the idea of what Re- uh, Brendan said, and I'm doing the same thing. My primary text is the New King James, but I have been reading through the Bible uh, on a daily basis using right now the Christian Standard Bible, you know, you know, just looking at it. because uh, So you've got different versions. And so, uh, uh, and, and again, you see the differences. And if you're familiar with the translation that you normally use, if you've done that two or three times, uh, you're going to notice the difference. And whenever there's a difference that comes up, sometimes uh, it, uh, it uh, I'm not a red flag, but, it, but it, it tells you, you know what, I need to look at this a little, I need to look at this a little closer. And so that would be one of the things that you give consideration to that. And, and of course, you know, sometimes you've got words. And remember, uh, remember, where the Bible is a is a book that has been translated from the Greek language. And we know that in the English language, and this was somewhat true in the Greek language, is that there are multiple English words that can be translated from one Greek word. And not only that. There are multiple English. There are multiple English words that have multiple definitions that are associated with those English words, and and so sometimes when you go to a different translation, it helps you make the distinction. I I could look at many examples, and, and let me just give a, a couple of them real quick here. You know, one of them is Second Timothy two fifteen. Uh, the King James version. Uh, says, study to show thyself approved unto God. And we often talk about that, that verse talks about study. Virtually every other translation, including the New King James that I use, says be diligent or give diligence. And so when you see that, it's time to ask, you know, is that word study legitimate? What's the right word to use there? And of course, what you find out is in our archaic language, the idea of study involved the idea of you were diligently putting forth effort to learn about something, to think about something. And clearly in that text, it's talking about handling God's word accurately. So when I talk about the word, um, when I use quote that verse, I often will quote be diligent, but I often go back to the King James and put the word study in there just to emphasize that's what study is. Study is putting forth diligent effort to understand what is being saying so that you can rightly divide. And there's another example. The New American Standard uses the expression handling accurately. And so you got there just another example of two different translations give you two different ideas about that. Uh, You could also look at uh, another one uh, that is interesting is Romans 12 and verse 1, where we are to present our bodies a, a living sacrifice, be transformed. The the last phrase of that expression says uh, uh, that you may prove what it was what Romans. Let me re get this here on my Bible. <laughs> it says, uh, "Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service." Present you know, and so you present your bodies as your reasonable service. And the New American Standard uses the expression, uh, which is your spiritual service of worship. And there are some versions that only use the word reasonable worship there or something like that. That tells you you've got some translations saying service and others saying worship. Well, what do those two terms have in common? And you've got this flag that comes up. And this goes with what Brendan said. Hey, maybe I need to study worship. And of course, what you'll learn is that the English word worship, or there's two or three Greek words that can be translated worship in the English language, and they actually have deal with different elements of worship. And so, you know, that would be an example of that. And you could look at many other examples. So that's just something to think about. Now, uh, the final point that I want to make as I deal with this is uh, some suggestions that I have um, as you think about multiple translations. I've already mentioned number one is I have a primary translation, you know, and and that's what you're going to be building off of. And, you know, it's possible that when you start looking at other translations, you will say, maybe I 
need to switch my primary translation. But at the same time, uh, you know, start with that translation and then pick another, um, uh, another translation to read from time to time. And uh, as you're doing that, one of the things you need to think about, and this is a whole nother topic, but I say consider different quote unquote families where those translations are concerned. Uh, you know, for example, what what approach to manuscripts do they take? The, the King James, New King, King James, take a different approach to translations than most of the more modern translations. I'll just say it that way. The other one to think about when you talk about families is there's different types of translations. You know, for example, there are your word for word translations, and that was what Brendan was talking about. And there are your uh, thought for thought translations, which which basically present the word of God in a totally different way. There is balance, which tries to do a balance between the two, and some of them lead closer to word for word, some closer to thought for thought. And then you ultimately have the paraphrase. And sometimes those thought for thought translations can give you a better idea of the meaning of various words and so on. But I, I'm going to tell you this personally, I recommend that your primary translation be a word for word translation. And then you can build from that standpoint. And then the final observation I make as far as suggestions is there are parallel Bibles out there. And those are Bibles that actually line up two or three translations next to each other. And then there's software that's available free software, or you can spend as much money as you want on software, <laughs> Bible software, but there's free software out there where you can compare translations, put them side by side on a screen, and then you can see the differences and you can go from there. So that's my point. I know I said a lot. I probably rambled, but hopefully the, hopefully you got the gist. All right, Tom, I appreciate that. Good points. And like you said, this is one of those topics we could probably spend a lot of time on. But I think what you said was very good and very concise. And so, but with that being said, let's go ahead and move on. And then if we have time at the end, we'll step back, see if there's any additional thoughts. Let me see if we have any comments real quick and nothing has come in. So let's plow right ahead with this pearls of wisdom, I guess, with Brian. Uh, and your pearls next tip for wisdom. Bible study. Pearls of wisdom. I think that's the great way to describe it. Kind of like a pearl here. So, you know, I like to think <laughs> that's a special blessing to you all. Um, you know, uh, what we're all kind of talking about, we're kind of overlapping a lot. Uh, and uh, you'll kind of hear a lot of the same thoughts, I'm sure. Kind of funny that when I wrote my thoughts out, I think John had written out almost the exact same thoughts. So if you're not sure about what i'm saying call john and ask him and he can explain it in a better way than i could i, I would say one of the hardest things for bible studies figuring out or making myself have to study and, and actually brendan brought up some great examples of sometimes you just get asked a question and you want to you write it down you're going to come back and study it um what i want to talk about is the idea of letting the bible define itself that's kind of a broad topic but i want to give some examples of what i mean by this uh, whenever we talk about the idea of, first of all, reading parallel accounts of something I'm studying. Uh, second of all, uh, whenever I come to a, a difficult passage, I try to define the words from the Bible. And then finally, if I'm stuck in a difficult passage, what I like to do is find out what the Bible is not saying in a passage. So I'm going to give you those three tips uh, under the heading of the idea of of trying to let the Bible define itself whenever we are being good Bible students. So to begin with, what I want us to consider is how it is that we let the Bible uh, or we use the Bible to define itself by using parallel texts. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, one marvelous thing about the Bible is it never says something just once. Um, and sometimes it's fairly obvious uh, when, there's an, uh, when there's a parallel text. I mean, the Gospels are obviously parallel texts to one another. Um, you know, we have Old Testament accounts uh, like Chronicles and Kings and Samuel that are parallels to each other. Other times it's not so obvious. Just recently, I was studying the book of Ephesians. I was in Ephesians chapter 1, and that's kind of a complicated chapter. Some, some difficult things get said there. And one of the first things I did was I asked myself, what is the parallel to this chapter say? Well, how do I find the parallel? 
Um, this is where some of the tools that you have in your Bible are kind of useful. Maybe you look down and you notice that uh, there's a lot of little footnotes or there's cross references. And you might pick up that sometimes those cross references, verse after verse after verse, keep going to the same text. In fact, I, I would suspect if you were to go through Ephesians chapter 1 and look at the cross references, it would take you over to Colossians chapter 1 a lot. Uh, Ephesians and Colossians are in a way parallel books. They say a lot of things that uh, in the same format, in the same order. And so I sometimes would say that if I wonder what Ephesians is saying, or go to Colossians. If I wonder what Colossians is saying, I go over to Ephesians. And so the first tool that I often use is to look at a parallel text. Um, it's easy to find a parallel text once you know what you're looking for. In other words, you're kind of using those cross-reference tools that are pointing you to different passages, and you're jumping back and forth and saying, hey, is, is Paul saying the same thing here? Um, Paul talking about in 1 Corinthians 12 or Romans 12, uh, the gifts that are given to us. That's a neat cross-reference statement. Um, talking about the armor of God in different places. Talking about the fruits of the Spirit in different places. You look for terms that are repeated, that are spoken about in different places. Other times you look for the same subject matter. Um, let's say the subject is church discipline. You might say, uh, I know that there's a church discipline passage saying... 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, or I know there's one in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and by the subject you can find a parallel passage. But one of the first things I always do when I'm trying to study a passage is I look and say, what does the parallel tell us? And this is using the Bible as the tool to define itself, and that's a useful thing to do, so I'm letting the Bible define itself. It's telling me uh, what exactly it is that I'm looking at in different words, and that's a great tool. So I look at Ephesians uh, chapter 1, or I look at Colossians chapter 1, and they both are telling me kind of the same thing, the glory of God, the great workings of God. But let's say there's still some things in there that are kind of confusing. You know, for example, in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul uses a word that he doesn't use in Colossians. He talks about being predestined. Well, predestined is a kind of a tough word. I know that Calvinists use it a way that um, is a little bit confusing, predestination, and I need to understand that better. So the second thing I would say we want to do is we want to learn how to sit down and define Bible words. There are words in the Bible that we don't use every day. Um, I, in fact, I can't think of one single time I've ever used the word propitiation uh, outside of a scriptural usage of that. There's a lot of words, justification, sanctification. These are all words that are used in the Bible that I need to let the Bible define. And that's important, by the way, because we know there's a lot of times where people take words out of the Bible and define them their own way. And that's a really dangerous idea. For example, if I want to understand the word fellowship, I know that one's a word that gets used all sorts of ways. I would say, what is the Bible defined? And, and by the way, I'm not saying go to a lexicon. I'm suggesting we should go to what the Bible says, because the Bible defines words for us. Um, so again, that word fellowship, First John chapter 1 might be a place I would go. I would look up the word fellowship, let's say, in some kind of reference guide that would show me different uses of it. And I might notice that in First John chapter 1, that's a pretty common usage of the word fellowship. And I might look there. And one of the things I would find is that in First John chapter 1, John gives us the definition of fellowship. Uh, he tells us about fellowship, and he calls it walking in the light. And, and that's a wonderful thing about the Bible. Not only do we have everything said more than once, when we have a complicated word, we almost always have synonyms for that word. And synonyms are a fantastic tool, words that are the same thing. And so I might say, you know, one term for fellowship is walking in the light, is abiding in Christ. And I might then have a better sense of understanding. So I look at a word uh, as I go back to Ephesians chapter 1, and I look at that word predestination. And I would find that that's not a word used too often, but I would see in Colossians how Paul speaks about the idea of Christ having been something that was preordained. And I might think, well, preordained sounds a lot like predestined, uh, ordained and destined, having a similar thought there. And, and I might be able to put together the understanding of what that means. So the second tool uh, of the three ideas of letting the Bible define itself, the second tool is find out how the Bible defines a word and uh, try to stick with that definition. That helps. But let's say a word like predestined, I'm not finding an easy definition. Here I am in Ephesians chapter one, and I'm struggling with this word. Brian's third rule of Bible study is sometimes it's more important to understand what the Bible is not saying than what it is saying. 
Um, that's a little bit of a shocker, but it actually, let me explain what I mean, and it's not that not that strange of a statement. Uh, there's a lot of times where something is said, and I'm just not exactly sure what it's saying. Well, what is important then is to sit down and try to understand what the Bible is not saying. So instead of looking for other synonyms in the Bible, I try to look for ideas in the Bible that might explain to me what something is not saying. So for example, I look at the word predestination. I know how some people define the word predestination. I might try to find other ways in the Bible that would say what predestination is not. Um, so for example, I might you know remember, hey, in 1 Timothy 2, uh, Paul makes the statement that God desires all men to be saved or uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. So I might say predestination cannot be, uh, it cannot be the idea that God is trying to uh, only save certain people and not others and that we have no choice in the matter. Um, I might find lots of different statements that give me that. And I'll take out of my misunderstanding, my, my lack of understanding about the word, I'll take out the things it can't mean. And then what I'm left with Maybe I'm left with one, two, three different ideas of, of things I might think it could mean. Well, that's again where the usefulness is. The Bible's going to tell me these things in other places. So sometimes it's more important to understand what a, a text, a difficult text is not saying than what it is saying. Because if I can take out what I know it's not saying and what I'm left with, I'll come across that somewhere else. And, and I sometimes tell people what I do is I take it and I put it on a shelf in my mind and say, I'm not sure I understand this, but I know what it's not saying, and I'll put it up here. So once I've taken out what it's not saying, I, I'm I'm not likely to misapply it or misunderstand it, or you know, as uh, as uh, Peter warns us in Second Peter chapter three, those uh, that sometimes the writings of Paul are are difficult to understand, and people who are untrained, untaught, and uh, unstable. Well, I'm not untrained and unstable if I'm finding what it doesn't say and then avoiding that and just trying to understand it through other things. So I typically point to those three ideas when I talk about Bible study. I say, let's let the Bible define itself. And we do that by number one, looking at the parallels in the Bible of uh, nothing is said just once. Number two, letting the Bible define words for us. And finally, number three, when I'm really stuck, I say, what is the Bible not saying as the most important thing I need to come out of that study with? So there are three thoughts for you to think about today. Okay. You know, Brian, and part of this, I didn't realize this until kind of preparing my point that I threw over to you, <laughs> was back during the time of the Reformation, this was the big difference between the Protestants and the Catholic Church. And there's a Latin saying, and I'm not going to try to say it because I'll just mess it up, but it translates into the Holy Scriptures are self-interpreters. And that was kind of, instead of having requiring the church to interpret the scriptures for us, the idea was the Bible should be its own best. We would say the Bible is its own best commentary. Mm -hmm. That would be a way of, of looking at that, yeah. Okay, so before, oh. oh, go ahead, Brandon, before we move on. Mm -hmm. to, to Brian's point, if I may hijack it to prop my own point up a little bit more. Uh, this is where um, the Old Testament is indispensable for the Christian. Now to be clear, Colossians makes it clear, nailed to the cross. Hebrew writer tells us that when the new came, the old was ready to go away. However, the language of salvation is introduced for us in the law of Moses of the price for sin. What does atonement mean? The New Testament feels no need to redefine those concepts because God's already defined those concepts in his last covenant. So, this, this is where when we read the whole Bible, we can say, okay, like on concepts like the atonement, we can say, okay, uh, the, the Calvinistic idea of propitiary atonement, or not propitiary, uh, Jesus taking our place and took our all that stuff, you know, can't really hold with the, with, with the concepts that were introduced in Leviticus about, no, atonement is something done on behalf of the sinner. It's done in, you know, the sacrifice there to cover the sins. You know, the, the whole Bible, as we've been saying, commentates on itself and gives us these concepts. And so it's one it's one whole picture, kind of like that hymn we sometimes sing, uh, number 500 and hymns for worship, give me the Bible, law and love combining. You know, that's that's the whole thing there. So, OK, Brendan, comment over. I was going <laughs> to just if I could for a moment, just say that I really appreciate what Brian said, because. Sometimes we take one obscure passage that maybe we can't find a lot of other references to, and we create a whole system 
uh, of thought from that one passage. And we ought to be careful about that. Um, you know, it, one difficult, hard uh, passage, uh, while I believe that absolutely it's truth, absolutely it's inspired, but we ought to be careful about something that we're really struggling with just to create some entire uh, system of belief about some topic uh, over that. That's all I had. One great example of that is the phrase baptism of the Holy Spirit. You know, there's only three passages in the New Testament that references it like that. You know, and so either you limit it to what the text says about that or you expand upon it with the theology and theological reasoning and so forth. Um, good point. So we had a question that came in during Tom's uh, tip regarding multiple translations. And I'm going to go ahead and bring it up on the screen real quick. I think it's a very good question and one we'll, we'll, we'll answer pretty quickly. Um, Janae Bowles asks, what version is considered a word by word translation? And some of the more, um, the more notable ones, aside from a straight interlinear um, where you have the Greek and a translation together there, if you really want a good one, the American Standard Version is probably one of the best as far as word for word translations. King James is pretty good as well. A, the Amer American Standard Version is really good, but it's kind of hard to read. The New York American Standard Bible follows that up with a couple of versions of it. Brendan introduced us to the Legacy Standard Bible, which is basically the New American Standard Bible with some tweaks to it, which adds some consistencies. Because, for instance, and um, let me throw a side by side up if a Brendan or someone wants to comment here on this. There are certain times in one text you'll have a Greek word used let's say four different times within the text. And sometimes the translators will use different English words depending on what they perceive the context to be. And with the Legacy Bible, Brendan, is this right? It kind of tries to be consistent translating the Greek word with the same English word each time. Sorry, repeat Brendan. the question. <laughs> <laughs> Brian All distracted me. So the legacy, Brendan, the legacy Brendan was sleeping at the wheel. I want to make that point. So the Legacy Standard Bible seeks to take the New American Standard Bible and tweak mm -hmm. it. So making sure that all Greek words in a context are translated by the same English word as you're reading through the context. Is that right? If I remember what yeah, I read. So the, the two the two notable cases are um so the one thing is it goes back to what the old ASV did, and that is the names of God are translated in the Old Testament, and they try and do that consi consistently. So I think Brian Haynes had answered a question like this yesterday on a different program about the use of the name Jehovah or Yahweh. So the legacy standard does translate the names properly. It says it's Adonai, Yahweh, Yah, El, all that in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, the big change was the term doulos, which is the Greek word for slave. Okay. Most modern translations in the American context translate that as bond servant due to our own history with that. But there's a different word for bond servant. And so the legacy tries to be more consistent in every time doulos appears, it's translated slave. And so think of it as it's just a it's an update of the new American standard to try and make okay. it more consistent with um, its original mission and aim to make the most literal, the most readable. So, OK. Another one considered would be, oh, go ahead, Brendan, sorry. I was clearing my throat. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. I got something to say. Um, the New King James Version I find to be really good as well. The ESV seeks to do a word for word. Now the ESV, the New American Standard Bible, the Legacy Standard Bible, and even the ASV use a kind of an older set of manuscripts and that's a whole nother discussion, okay. Um, the the the, Christ, the the CSB the Hallman Christian Standard Bible started out when they initially got started when you read the, the 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 introduction they set out to be a word for word when it was readable and when it created a little more difficulty in the in the text they would then switch to a thought idea there and um, so but anyway so I would recommend the New King James the ASV if you want to it's a little harder to read. The New American Standard Bible, Legacy Standard Bible, the English Standard Version um, are, are the ones that, that I like to turn to when looking for trying to get as close as possible. Brendan. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And, 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 sorry, go ahead, Tom. Hold on, Tom, just a second. Oh, okay. Oh. Um, so 
on that point, uh, it should be noted that basically there really has not been a new translation uh, in almost 100 years. Most of our modern translations are simply a revision or updating of the legacy of the King James or the American Standard Version. For example, the English Standard Version has its origins in the Revised Standard Version, which was an update of the American Standard Version, which was an update of the Revised Version of the King James Bible. So, and why, you know, why all these translations and why word for word? It's basically because the, the mission of translation has remained unchanged since 1611 when the King James translators in their preface said their goal was to make the word of God in the language of Canaan, even that the most vulgar can understand that in their language. Exactly. So basically they wanted the Bible in the common tongue so everyday people could understand it. Um, and so these all try to be word for word so we can have the most accurate Bibles possible um, but also readable so we can understand it. So, yeah. And some of um, them you do see a hint of a theological position or denominational yeah. viewpoint, you know, kind of carried through. Um, the NET is something I've not looked into a whole lot. The New English Translation, hmm. isn't that more the online um, it, type? It's, it started that way. Um, but when the second edition, they saw a need for to do a print and the big value in the net bible is let me just grab it real quick is that it's the first bible that they published with all the translators notes hold and it so we'll bring it a little bit to your center there you go this is a good page because most of it is text but there are some pages where you have one verse and yeah. the rest of oh here's a good example Ecclesiastes 1, this is the verse. Wow. <laughs> These are the translator's notes. So if you read something, you're like, well, that's weird. Why they do that? They're More often they give you an explanation. They'll cite the literature and everything else. And so I read through this one last year, and my rating took a little bit longer only because I'm like, huh, why that happened? I hovered over it in my Bible software and explained why that happened or why they translate it that way. Which, by the way, you don't always agree with them. Yeah, but yeah you get distracted. You get the logical behind yeah. it. When so, for that alone, this was. I really like it for that purpose only, um, but it, it it's been pretty good. So yeah, someone called the uh, the Le Legacy Standard Bible a Bible for nerds. Yeah, yeah, um, <laughs> but that's that's a good point. Okay, well, more we could say about it. I hope that answers your question. Um, regarding what would be a good word for a translation. Uh, there are some I would definitely avoid because if they, they do a dynamic, dynamic equivalency. That's the thought translation type thing. But Hey, John. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Can, can I just real quickly interject? I know we get, we're get run out yeah. of time. Mm -hmm. oh, but, uh, oh, by the way, the King James was a revision too. Uh, just so that you know that. Sixteen, but um, but anyways, you know, uh, uh, it's a fascinating study to study word for word versus thought for thought, which is what you're talking about, or the dynamic equivalence and so on. And uh, yeah. uh, uh, and the the thing to understand about almost every translation, including all of them that we've talked about, they have a degree of what they call balance. Very few translations are actually word for word because you just wouldn't be able to follow it. Uh, so we, most translations are balanced. The question is, and what we mean by balance is there, there's going to be some thought for thought in there, but we want translations that lean more closer to the spectrum of being word for word than thought for thought. And the thought for thought becomes a good Bible study uh, uh, tool in helping you to understand the word for word. That's, uh, I'm done. <laughs> Well, I think that's a good point. And what a lot of people, I say a lot of people, it's not widely circulated that the, um, and I've got it somewhere in this book here, the King James Bible, they used the Great Bible, they used the, the Geneva bishops. Bible, the Bishop's yeah. Bible. They used all those predecessors as well as Erasmus's Greek text to translate the King James Bible in 1611. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it was like the fourth revision in English. I mean, it was the fourth English yeah. Bible. Yeah. And, and Brendan said a while ago, and, we, and I'm about to throw it over to Brendan for a, a fourth tip. 
But these, the, the good ones, the scholars are trying their best to get the actual word that was inspired by the Holy Spirit written many, many years ago into an understandable, readable format today. And that's what their goal is, so that when we're reading our text today, we are reading what was written back then, not a summary of it, not a, you know, a, a, a guess on it, but an actual what the text is supposed to be. So, But anyway, let's jump ahead while we have a little bit of time remaining to Brendan and our fourth tip. In just a minute, I mean, just for our audience, I guess if you want to waste, uh, you know, you want to drag out the study or something and you really want to get us going, ask a question about translations and we'll talk all day. Um, it, it's, uh, you could tell we're Bible nerds here. So, um, but I'll make this point quick since we are running low on our time in our study. So the fourth tip on Bible study, let's take notes. Have some way to take notes, be a journal, a Word document, even a wide margin Bible. Um, and, you know, wide margin Bibles have been called the, the thinking person study Bible because you get a lot of empty space and you can mark up the text and you can take your notes, but have some sort of way to take notes because knowledge left in the head is liable to fall out of the head. Um, and so when you take notes, um, I would say daily when you're doing daily Bible reading. Just record what you found was interesting, what you thought was what grabbed your attention, what you have questions about, and then that's all you do for daily note taking. Um, and then when it comes time to study, and I've I've recommended this to people, you should be reading the Bible daily, maybe five days a week, and then set aside time on Saturday or sometime on the weekend, maybe Sunday afternoon, and spend an hour on on, on study, something you're going to go more in depth on. So when it comes time to study. You can go back over your notes and be like, okay, well, I had a question about this this week, so this is what I'm going to study this week. Um, and so when you're studying, um, so, you know, two different ways, I guess, of note-taking, whether you're doing a, a textual or expository study or you're doing a topical study. Um, you know, first of all, record all your observations when you're working through a text, anything and everything. Um, and so... I have a tool for that. We don't have time to talk about it, but it's very helpful. Okay, I'm trying to talk about it. Go to go to your Bible software, go to Bible Gateway, it's free. Copy and paste their copy the text you're working with, paste in a Word document. Make sure it's two inch margins, double space, and print that out. Then you can mark up the text all day long, record all your notes, and you don't have to worry about damaging your Bible. And a lot of the comments and a lot of the stuff you're gonna record. It might be wrong, it might be off base, but it's important just to get it out there on the page. And as you work through the text, you're like, okay, well, I answered that question. That thought was wrong. You you can go through that. Um, if you're going through a book study, it's very helpful to outline the chapter and summarize it. That gets you a good feel if you have actually learned that chapter. And this seems like, why am I doing all this work? It's It's helpful in the long term. Because I did that work with, say, Revelation, I can go back when I start preparing my study notes for teaching it. I'm like, okay, I have my outlines. I have my summaries. I know what's going on. Now I can get into the nitty gritty. Uh, because, you know, sometimes if you don't know what's going on, you don't know the overall thrust of the passage or the chapter, you're, you set yourself up sometimes to take certain texts and run wild with it. Uh, devoid of context. And I'm not going to say anything more on that because that's a, a, a point coming up. Uh, so refer back to your previous notes when you're studying. Um, see, you know, if you can improve upon them. Um, you know, the note taking is very helpful because say you get asked if you're a man in the congregation, hey, preach coming out of town, we need you to do a lesson or we need you to teach a class. Well, you can go back through and I'll guarantee you if you had a question about a text and you found it to be a really edifying study, your brethren are going to find that to be a really good Bible class because you're going to be passionate about it. It's a question you had and you're able to answer it and you have all those notes. Um, and one last thing on taking notes, something my college professor had told me in my history classes, said, if you really want to get the most out of your notes, uh, he said, write, write your notes in class. Uh, don't try and take everything word for word, but, you know, write the phrases, write the key information. When you get home, review those notes and then later type them up. 
And the his reasoning behind that was it makes you engage with the material three different times in three different ways. And it allows you to think through the material what is actually what is actually the core concepts and what's important here. Um, and I'd recommend doing that on sermon notes, Bible class notes, and start having a process there that you're recording and archiving these notes in some way. Because, you know, for example, we had a member here who passed away before I moved. But when his widow moved out of her home, she had these, I think they were six inch binders, might have been five inch binders, binders and binders and binders. Each of them on the spine had a book of the Bible labeled on it. Those were the notes that her late husband had taken and compiled on each book of the Bible. I mean, his, his binder on Romans was like five inches thick, and he could refer back to that year after year, keep adding to it. So when he it came time for him to study something or to teach, he had all that uh, work there done. So take notes. It'll be good for you. And I'm going to end my point here with a quote from Barry Kirchhoffville. A Bible is not meant to be kept in pristine condition. It is a tool for knowledge. So use it, and when you've worn out, buy another one. Um, but these are tools for our growth and our knowledge. So back to John. Appreciate that, Brendan. I've got something in my library that someone left behind or, or when they passed away that was given to me. Um, and you know, it just looks like real simple. This is the New Testament, and this is from like years ago. And y'all might remember something like this. One column with plenty of note-taking pages. There was a, a preacher many, many years ago named Jonathan Edwards who had created something himself like that. He would paste in a page of the Bible on a big old open page. And uh, this is just, just the, the and it's just New Testament, very start of it. It's like that thick. But the point is, he's right. Take notes. If you don't like writing in your Bible Bible, Write it in a mm -hmm. notebook, number the pages, and then put a mark in your Bible. See notebook this page or something like that, you know. And, and to John's point, um, I forgot to plug this. I'm going to plug it. There are some called scripture journals now available in pretty much every major translation. And so what I do when I preach through a book or I'm studying through a book, I have bought one. This is First and Second Thessalonians, which I'm preaching through right now. And so what I'm able to do, I can take all my notes on the text, and then the next page over, I can take all my notes. And what's great is when I'm done with this, it goes on my shelf as Brendan's commentary in Thessalonians, which will be useless in the next two years because, you know, you're growing. But um, five bucks, depending on how big, <clears throat> how big the book is, and I think they're well worth the investment. Plus, you're a member and your preacher's preaching through a book of the Bible, or you're studying through a book of the Bible, buy one of these and take notes in Bible class or as he's preaching. And then you have all of it in one place. So, all right, yeah. I'm going to end my ranting here on this. So I have the ESV version of those, and they're, they're real nice. They're real handy to use. All right, so let's, Paul, bring, let's go ahead and bring you in. And if you would kind of bring in the summary with the fifth and final tip for beneficial Bible study. Uh, I'll, I'll do that the very best I can. On Brendan Brendan's uh, wrap up there, uh, I remember uh, I bought a Bible once and I bought it on eBay, and it was a used Bible, and it said that it looked like it had never been out of the box. And I thought, well, what a deal for me! But how sad uh, that someone uh, had a Bible that was quite a few years old because it was out of print, and uh, that's why I was wanting it. But um, well, how sad it was that someone had the Word of God there and, and never even uh, took the uh, leather-bound copy out of the box. Uh, I wanted to talk about for just a moment, and I will try to be very brief uh, because I know that we're, we're short on time. But in, in one of the, I suppose, most basic errors that I made, uh, I'm sure there's errors I make now, but uh, errors I made as a young preacher was ripping passages mercilessly out of context, uh, not paying attention to the verses before, the verses after, uh, what uh, the uh, Holy Spirit through the inspired writer was revealing to us, but just uh, grabbing a point and making that, um, making that point. I think that's one way in which uh, there's been great misunderstandings uh, in Scripture. For instance, uh, I mentioned in, in my notes, uh, Romans 10, 13, for whoever calls upon the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. And people, I've seen that quoted all over the place, and uh, saying that is God's plan of salvation, that uh, just to call out and ask for salvation, and that's kind of the idea where the sinner's prayer comes from. But as you read on down through there, you read about how important it is that those who preach the gospel go forth preaching, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, uh, that they're uh, going forward, taking that word out. And he even mentions there uh, that uh, in verse 16, but not all, um, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. And he quotes from Isaiah then. And so we realize that gospel obedience is important. And so when we rip the one verse out of context, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, uh, we do a disservice to the importance of uh, gospel obedience, uh, uh, repenting and confessing and being baptized. Uh, another thing that I just wanted to mention, and I'll do this very briefly, is that oftentimes you'll see in the New Testament, and in, if you're using the New King James translation, uh, you'll notice that it's almost always in all caps. There are quotes in the New Testament from the Old Testament. And so if you see that in quotes uh, as a reference, or you notice in your New King, New King James Bible that it's in all caps, uh, go find where that passage came from and see what was being talked about in that reference in the Old Testament, and it'll help you a great deal to understand uh, in the New Testament. Uh, in uh, Jesus' teaching in Matthew 21 13, we find uh, where he talks about uh, they had made his father's house a den of thieves. That's actually a, a reference back to Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 11. And it helps and, and it expands your knowledge to go back, see what Jeremiah was writing about, but then bring in also what, uh, what Jesus was teaching there. And so I really appreciate all the good work the guys did in putting this together. And if you didn't notice, uh, we did, that our points all kind of had an overlapping nature and that probably speaks to the importance of learning how to study well uh, learning how to benefit from that time we spend in study and learning the lessons and then of course i'll just finish with saying this that when you learn the lessons make sure you apply them that you obey them that you do them john yeah paul i appreciate that um one one final thought and then we'll bring up the summary chart real quick just kind of as a five plus one, a bonus tip. Always view the Bible as we call it the Bible, the book. View it as coming from God. Someone touched on it. I think Brenda did at the very start. All scripture has been breathed out by God. When you begin to doubt the authenticity, especially of like the Old Testament, then it begins to unravel everything that's found within the scriptures there. So as long as you view it as the word of God, and hold to that and that it is right above all else, then your studies will be on course. And and that and I think the more you study, the more that conclusion, that that uh, respect is going to be um, fortified as you go through the studies there. So let's go ahead and bring everything up here. Here's what we looked at today. Five tips for beneficial Bible study. Build the habit of daily Bible reading. It's a good start. Access multiple translations. Good idea. Good practice. Let scriptures define scriptures. That's kind of Brian's point. In other words, let the holy text um, explain itself. Let the Bible be its own best commentary. Have a way to take notes. That's so important. Get you a notebook. If it's something simple, it's just a spiral binder. You know, Number the pages. That may help you. And make sure you put the Bible reference down that, that you're notating on. Great way to go. And then always examine the text. Look closely at the context. You wouldn't like it if you wrote a letter and someone pulled one line out of it and said you professed to doing something that maybe you were expressing in a dream, telling a friend about. You get the point though. We don't want to be taken out of context and God's word must not be either. All right, so let me bring it back and bring everyone in. Gentlemen, I really appreciate all the participation. I really appreciate all the work in developing these points. Next week, we're going to be talking about five dangers facing, um, I think it's the local church or churches. Let me double check that real quick. I think I made a specific point. Five dangers facing the local church. Yeah, five dangers facing local churches is what we're going to be looking at next week. So be considering as we develop the lesson through the course of this week, what you, as talking about the five guys here, 
view as dangers facing local churches. And listen, no, nothing, nothing is is um, nothing exempted. Hit the preachers, hit the elders, hit <laughs> you know, hit the members. What whatever you think might be a danger to the local church, we're going to talk about that. And for those watching at home, be looking for um, as we share this on Facebook. And you, if you want to go ahead and drop your comments ahead of time on the event, if, if it'll allow you to do that, tell us what you think will be dangers or what are dangers to the local churches there. All right, gentlemen, any final thoughts before we pull it to a close? I just want to say thank you to everybody who commented or questioned today, and we encourage you to send those questions in to our email, either individually or at truthfactorlive.com. And be sure to uh, catch us next week, same time, same place. And we always are appreciative of when you, the audience, uh, are active and participate in these studies. That's right. That's right. If you're watching us on YouTube, be sure to subscribe to our channel if you'd like to do that. If you like this video, as they say, smash the like button. I'm a little more gentler. Just hit the like button. If you're following us on Facebook or if you're watching us on Facebook, Follow us there as well. And remember, you can always email us, questions at truthfactor.com. We'd love to hear from you. Well, thank you so much for joining us for our study today. And Lord willing, we will see you back here again next Thursday at 11 o'clock a.m. Central Time for our next Truth Factor discussion. Have a wonderful, wonderful week.